Okay. Already. Then mm. I would say without uh, a big introduction, I'm just saying that Vanya Wiese is a long-term friend of IK and a philosopher who has, I think, learned under uh, Thomas Metzinger, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he will present now on ethics of AI in psychiatry. So welcome, Vanya. Thank you for taking the time and the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to give this talk. And um, I hope you can see the presentation. So I just um, start with um, a little bit of history. This is Eliza, which um, I guess um, all or most of you have heard about or know. And um, it's an early chatbot that was originally developed by Joseph Weizenbaum in um, 1966. And um, what, what you saw here is a more contemporary implementation of this chatbot. And Eliza was meant to be, or to, to simulate a psychotherapist. And um, here's a short uh, conversation I had with Eliza. So Eliza sh says, is something troubling you? Me, chatbots are all alike. Could there really be some connection? I think they don't really understand me. Do you say you think they don't really understand you for some particular reason, special reason? Uh, yes, because it's true. You seem to be quite positive. I've been talking a lot to chatbots recently. You say you've been talking a lot to chatbots recently? Yes, at least they listen to me. I understand. Oh, I wish that was true. That's quite interesting. Do you actually find that interesting? What are your feelings now? So as you can see already from, from this example, you cannot have a real conversation with Eliza. But if you're willing to forget that you're just interacting with a, a very simple chatbot, you can actually have the impression that you're talking to someone who, is, who understands you. And now um, we've come a long way since the 1960s. And in this talk, I will uh, take a look at some more recent developments and then discuss philosophical and ethical um, problems associated with these more recent developments. Um, so the title of this talk is Ethics of AI in Psychiatry, which, as you may have noted, is ambiguous between two, two readings. Uh, the first is um, ethics of AI or AI ethics as it is applied in, in psychiatry. So because this could mean, for instance, what do psychiatrists know about um, ethics of AI? or um, what do, you, do medical students learn about AI ethics? And then there's a, another reading, um, which is ethics of applications of AI and psychiatry. And this is actually what this talk will mainly focus on. Um, in the first part, I will uh, review some theoretical and practical problems in psychiatry, which then already motivates why um, people use AI in psychiatry in the first place. And what you get when you do that is digital and computational psychiatry. And in the final part, I will discuss some philosophical and especially ethical problems associated with such applications. So um, as I noted, Eliza was meant to simulate a psychotherapist, but it was never meant to be actually used in psychotherapy. And this has changed. So um, today we have more powerful um, chatbots and digital assistants. We have Siri and Alexa and many others. We have chatbots such as Cookie, formerly known as Mitsuku or Replica or GPT-3, which of course is not a chatbot um, because it's capable of producing all, all sorts of um, texts and is really impressive. Um, but um, you, you can actually also have a conversation with GPT-3 and there's a really nice example on YouTube, which many of you may already know. Um, and you can find it if you just search for GPT-3 on YouTube. Okay, and um, in, in fact, some chatbots, are, although Eliza ne never was meant to be actually used in psychiatry, in psychiatry or for psychotherapy, um, now there are people who are um, um, thinking about or trying to use chatbots and other conversational agents in mental health care. And um, in 2019, a review of applications of chatbots in mental health was um, published. And uh, one, so in, in general, the um, 
the result of this review is that there needs to be a lot more research and many things are still unknown. Um, but one um, really, I, I think, interesting finding was that for some people, it can be easier to open up to a chatbot and talk about their problems or uh, traumatic um, experiences. So it can be easier to open up to a chatbot than to a human being, which I think is really interesting. Okay, and um, more generally, we have, um, of course, other um, digital technology that can be used in mental health care. Um, there are lots of mental health apps which um, provide different services. Uh, for instance, mood tracking, or support for cognitive behavioral ther therapy, or suicide prevention, or even access to mental health professionals, or access to a peer community. And um, Naively, one could ask, why do we even need such applications of digital technology in psychiatry? Why do we need mental health apps if we have psychotherapy with actual human beings and uh, psychotropic drugs? And perhaps the, the obvious answer is that mental illness is such a massive global problem. Just to illustrate it, mental illnesses are globally among the leading causes of disability adjusted life years, which is the sum of um, years of life lived with disability and um, years, um, as, sorry, years of life lived, years lived with disability and years of life lost. Um, so it's really a massive global um, problem and um, what is more, access to mental health care is often severely restricted, not only in low income countries, but also in high income countries. So just as an example, in 2015, a study um, from the US found that the median duration of untreated psychosis in community clinics was uh, 74 weeks. So um, access to um, mental health care can, can be highly um, restricted depending on where you live. And so this is, of course, one of the advantages of digital technology and of um, mental health apps in particular, that they um, can increase the accessibility and they're also scalable. So many people already have a smartphone. And if you, um, if, if um, a mental, once a mental health app has been developed, it can in principle be used by anyone who, who owns a smartphone. So it can reach lots of people. And um, well, the digital psychiatry is not exhausted by using or developing mental health apps or chatbots. So um, in general, it um, comprises using um, email or text and video messaging to contact, for instance, a um, mental health care professional or um, using virtual reality to, um, to complement um, psychotherapy using chatbots, apps, and um, apps and robots. And then there's something called digital phenotyping, which I um, want to explain briefly. So um, this is a term coined in 2015. And the digital phenotype is defined as the collection of all health-related data in social media forums and online communities, wearable technologies, and mobile devices. And um, the but one idea of these authors, Janet L, is that digital phenotypes redefine disease expression in terms of the lived experience of individuals, which expands our ability to classify and understand disease. For instance, for a patient with insomnia, data regarding the timing and hours of one's digital footprint can be considered part of the disease's expression. Now here's a more, a more um, specific Example given by the authors, um, this is a timeline of insomnia related tweets by different users and um, yeah, on the y axis, the um, density of insomnia related tweets is uh, depicted at different times. And um, as you I, I hope can see there, um, there are some peaks, here's a dramatic peak um, in, in the density of insomnia related tweets, such as this one, with, which so it doesn't look like I'll be sleeping tonight. Um, and but it, this is considered as part of the, the digital phenotype. Um, slightly more generally, um, smartphones can be used to um, 
measure data using phone sensors, keyboard interaction, or um, voice and speech analysis. And um, these data constitute the digital phenotype, which um, is believed to be predictive of behavior, cognition, and mood. And um, the goals of digital phenotyping include using digital phenotypes as predictors of clinical diagnoses and using data to monitor and improve patient outcomes. And um, this te technology is, um, or these applications are still under development, but I think they're highly interesting and promising because um, I mean, if, if they work, they um, provide access to, um, well, or, or can at least um, support mental health care for everyone who has a smartphone. And um, this is really a, um, a, a great benefit of uh, digital phenotyping of this idea and of digital um, technology in, in mental health care in general. Okay, and then there are um, some other, uh, some further problems in psychiatry. Uh, one is the problem of misdiagnoses, especially with um, respect to mental disorders such as schizophrenia and uh, the prognosis of disease prog progression and the um, and treatment predictions can be extremely difficult to say the least. And just um, take um, schizophrenia as an example, uh, patients with the same diagnosis need not have any symptoms in common and uh, patients with the, same with the same symptoms can respond differently to the same medication. So it seems that there are, can really be different mechanisms underlying these symptoms. And a relevant question is what are the underlying mechanisms and causes of symptoms based on which um, mental illnesses are diagnosed? And an answer to this question might make diagnosis more stable and enable individual reliable prognoses and predictions. This is one of the hopes of um, the field of computational psychiatry, which uh, attempts to translate advance, advances in computational neuroscience and machine learning into improved outcomes for patients suffering from mental illness. And uh, it is common to make a distinction between two types of computational psychiatry data-driven and theory-driven approaches. Um, data-driven approaches use um, deep learning or support vector machines or big data, whereas uh, theory-driven approaches may use Bayesian inference reinforcement learning or dynamical models. And uh, slightly more systematically, data-driven approaches can be characterized as uh, using machine learning to um, uh, derive predictions on the basis of big data, and these predictions can concern, for instance, disease progression or response to medication, whereas uh, theory-driven approaches seek an explanation by modeling the underlying mechanisms. And a key concept here is that of, an, uh, of a computational assay, at least in uh, one branch of um, this, this type of computational psychiatry. So um, a computational assay is basically a model that is fitted to individual data, and these can be fMRI, e.g. or behavioral data, and that can then be used to infer the hidden causes, that's the underlying mechanism of the data. And ideally, this enables um, a differential diagnosis by detecting distinct mechanisms in patients with the same symptoms, and it um, may enable a low-dimensional representation of data sets, which can increase the performance of machine learning algorithms and also increase the interpretability of outcomes of these algorithms. So um, these um, uh, potential applications are still under development. Uh, development. So um, there are, um, as, as far as I know, um, no direct clinical applications so far, but it's um, also a really um, interesting and promising uh, field of research. So um, to sum up this uh, first part, if you combine AI and psychiatry, you get digital or computational psychiatry. It's common to distinguish two cultures or two types of um, approaches in computational psychiatry, data-driven and theory-driven approaches. And um, in, a, in a more recent paper, um, it's, it is proposed even to um, talk about uh, three cultures of computational psychiatry. 
And um, digital psychiatry actually then constitutes the third culture of computational psychiatry. So depending on how you use these terms, you, you can use computational psychiatry as a more general term encompassing both digital psychiatry and data-driven and theory-driven approaches in computational psychiatry. Um, so the, these are really um, highly related fields. Okay, let, let's now turn to some uh, philosophical and especially ethical problems. And I hope the ethical relevance of this type of research and these applications is relatively clear. Um, I mean, we also um, heard about this in uh, the wonderful um, talk by Christiane Floyd. Um, so there are chances and risks of applications of AI. This is true in general. And um, it's of course also true if you apply them in the context of psychiatry or mental health care. And one question that um, I'd like to focus here on here is um, how to structure ethical debates about AI in psychiatry, because um, there's already a huge literature on AI ethics and uh, ethical guidelines for AI and um, huge um, numbers of problems that are being discussed and different ethical principles. So it can be really confusing and I'll try to give something like a, a perhaps a slightly simplified framework here to, to uh, think about these problems. So on the one hand, you can um, talk about different domains in which AI can be applied in psychiatry. For instance, you can apply to um, support diagnosis or treatment. Um, then you can make a distinction between different ethical principles that are relevant to um, discussing uh, ethical problems here. And in AI ethics, um, it's very common to uh, refer to biomedical ethical principles that are already well established in um, uh, biomedical ethics. Um, and these principles were first proposed by um, Tom Beauchamp and James Childress in 1977. So uh, this reference here, uh, 2019, refers to the eighth edition of their book, Principles of Biomedical Ethics. And um, the, these, um, in, in this book, they proposed um, some uh, four ethical principles that are now well established and um, are also often referred to in discussions about AI ethics. And then there's a further principle, um, which um, is sometimes called explicability or explainability or transparency and um, which is extremely important in AI ethics. And um, actually it has two components, um, one of which is accountability or responsibility. And we already um, saw a really um, vivid illustration of this in, in the last talk. Um, and another example would be um, crashes with autonom autonomous vehicles. The question rises, who's accountable, who's responsible if something goes wrong. So um, systems should be designed in such a way um, that it is clear who is accountable or responsible for the way the system works. And then there's another component of uh, explicability, another factor, namely it should also be possible just to know how the system works or how it um, makes a certain um, a decision or gives a certain recommendation. And as you know, um, for instance, uh, deep neural nets can be trans, uh, intransparent or opaque, so it's not always clear how the system, uh, why the system classifies a given input in a particular way. Okay, so um, then there are certain um, problems that are associated with these principles, and these can be empirical or can, they can raise empirical or conceptual questions. And then more generally, one can talk about different ap ethical approaches, for instance, whether one wants to use general normative theories such, such as utilitarianism or virtue ethics or Kantian deontological ethics. Um, and you can contrast that with a more um, with an applied ethics approach in which you just um, discuss particular um, ethical problems or questions that arise in very specific contexts without just trying to apply a general normative theory. Okay, I want to um, focus on the first three um, uh, aspects here and in, in, in the final part and then briefly come back to the fourth point in the conclusion. 
So um, as I said, one, one can distinguish between different domains of application. AI can be used for early detection or screening of mental illnesses or mental health problems. It can be used to support diagnosis or treatment. And then there are ethical principles that are often um, referred to. Uh, these first four are the famous biomedical principles by Beauchamp and Childress. Um, the first beneficence, um, or in other words, do good. The second is non maleficence that is, uh, don't do harm. Third is respect for autonomy. The fourth, um, justice or be fair. And then there's a fifth principle, explainability, explicability, or transparency, which is um, really uh, important to AI applications. And then there can be associated conceptual, empirical, or legal problems. So I'd just like to illustrate um, these um distinctions here with some um, examples so um if for instance mental health apps are used for early detection or screening they would be highly beneficent because uh, ideally they would yield a preventive medicine or could be used for suicide prevention and this then um raises for instance empirical questions because one can use well um what, what one can ask what strategies for suicide preventions do smartphone tools or apps actually implement? That is um, tools that are meant to support or help in suicide prevention, which strategies are actually implemented and, um, and, and how well do these, um, do these tools work? These are um, empirical questions. Then um, another problem related to early detection or screening, non um, uh for instance, mood tracking apps that could be used for a screening, they um, pose a risk of epidemiological inflation, as it's called by Burr et al. And um, an example of this would be a mood tracking apps that allows you to track your anxiety over time and the mere fact that you become aware of how often you have been feeling anxious in, in the recent past might actually increase your anxiety and have negative effects on your well-being. And this is um, one, at least one risk of um, such applications. And this raises empirical questions. Well, how acute is this risk actually? And also raises legal questions. How should such applications be regulated in order to um, in order to prevent or minimize the risk of epidemiological inflation. Another aspect, um, autonomy. So this uh, speaks to data ownership and protection. And um, Kunchuku et al. 2017 is a um, review which um, well looked at um, ways of detecting depression and mental illness on the basis of social media data. Um, so it's actually um, possible to use uh, social media data to make predictions about um, mental health problems or the future development of mental illnesses. And even if it's not extremely accurate, it can be highly problematic if it's used by an algorithm, if, either if it's used um, intentionally, by, say by an employer or an insurance company, or if it's um, just implicitly used by an algorithm that is opaque and, that's, um, and um, so, so that the user doesn't really know what, what data um, or how the, the data is used and what the reasons are for, let's say, um, classifying a candidate for a job in a certain way. So this uh, raises empirical question, how well does this actually work? And legal questions, how can data be protected. And um, yeah, I mean, many social media data are already publicly available. So this is a real problem. Um, then related to autonomy, there are also uh, conceptual problems. Um, for instance, what does autonomy mean in a different context? What does it mean in clinical se um, settings as opposed to um, non-clinical set settings, for instance? And um, then in um, with, with respect to the diagnosis, um, there's uh, a, a risk related to non maleficence um, I mean, whenever you use an algorithm, something can go wrong. 
perhaps uh, the data has been biased, perhaps um, the, the algorithm has been trained on uh, data that doesn't represent certain minority groups of the population. And so it doesn't uh, pro provide, um, so it may provide incorrect diagnosis in certain cases. And then there's a problem of justice. Um, so um, some potential applications of computational psychiatry can be really expensive, for instance, if they're based on fMRI data. And um, so such applications just wouldn't be available to many people or most people. Uh, then uh, refers back to treatment, uh, there are the problems of beneficence and justice. Um, so on the one hand, um, I mean, um, digital phenotyping or mental health apps can be highly be beneficial because uh, they can reach more pace, patients and reduce costs. Um, and this is also um, more just. Uh, but then there's the potential of misuse as an excuse to cut budget for healthcare. So someone might say, well, we have these technologies and if they really work well, uh, we don't need to spend more money on conventional approaches and uh, conventional um, psychotherapy, for instance. So this would be a real problem. And then um, there's the problem of explicability. So when it comes to diagnosis and treatment, and here actually uh, potential explication, uh, applications of um, theory-driven computational psychiatry are really interesting because they could provide, if, if they are successful, they can provide more transparent diagnoses and treatment predictions, um, for instance, um, using computational assays. Um, okay. Um, this, I, I hope, um, was a, um, a not too confusing overview of some problems in AI ethics as it is, um, or applications of AI in psychiatry. And I'd like to close with some general observations or some take home messages and comments. The first um, is that ethics is not a tick box exercise. So this has been emphasized in a recent paper by Tilo Hagendorf. And um, there, there exist many guidelines, ethical guidelines for AI um, nowadays. And um, many of them just provide a list of problems and ethical principles. And one could get the impression that AI ethics is just about knowing about these principles and trying to um, yeah, take care that you you um, account for them and, and uh, solve the problems that are associated, and then you're fine. But um, actually, what, what would be desirable would be not just to see this as a tick box exercise, but to cultivate perhaps moral virtues. Um, that is um, not, not just thinking about this in, in terms of ethical principles, but ways of acting and thinking, which um, would be highly beneficial for um, uh, developing uh, AI applications in a responsible way. And um, interestingly, if I, I mean, many of these ethical guidelines refer to these biomedical eth ethical principles that are already mentioned. But if you, if you take a look at the, the book by Beauchamp and Childress, they explicitly say the goals and structure of medicine, healthcare, public health and research call for deep appreciation of moral virtues. Morality would be a cold and uninspiring practice without appropriate sympathy, emotional responsiveness, excellence of character, and heartfelt ideals that reach beyond principles and rules. So they do not just provide a list of principles in their book, but they actually say, well, this is one part of biomedical ethics you have to complement these ethical principles with moral virtues. So exactly what Hagendorf um, demands. And I think this is something that should be kept in mind when we're dealing with um, ethical guidelines for AI. Um, then um, another remark, AI in psychiatry could have transformative effects on the definition and classification of mental illnesses. Um, so for instance, at least in some uh, research, 
in um, computational psychiatry, there's an extreme focus on brain function, um, which I, I think could um, uh, lead to some tendencies when people think about what a mental illness is in the first place. Is it a social construct or is it a multi-level mechanism or um, is it a, uh, a network function or um, is it a, a brain disorder? And um, perhaps more to the, or, or more, more seriously or more, um, um, yeah, even more clearly a, a potential transformative effect or tendency can be seen in the very definition of a digital phenotype. So I already mentioned this, um, digital phenotypes, according to Jane et al, redefine disease expression in terms of the lived experience of individuals, which expands our ability to classify and understand disease. And now as a, a philosopher, this reminds me of Wilhelm Dilthey, a philosopher who lived in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and um, he made a distinction between the human sciences or the humanities and the natural sciences. And according to Dilthey, the human sciences are concerned with understanding things on the basis of lived experience. And the natural sciences, on the other hand, are concerned with causal explanations of things. So there's a distinction between understanding and explaining according to Dilthey. And now an uncharitable reading of this definition would be that if you try to redefine disease expression in terms of data that can be measured using your smartphone or in terms of social media data, um, you're not actually expanding our ability to understand disease, but you're providing a, an impoverished understanding which ignores the actual lived experience of individuals. And now, just to be clear, I, I think digital phenotyping is really interesting and promising, but it should not be regarded as a substitute for alternative ways of understanding disease should not be regarded as a redefinition of disease expression, but perhaps more as a complement. Okay, then um, another tr transformative effect could be on human relationships. Um, the, the risk exists um, that if robotic interventions are not translatable to improving human interaction, that they merely remain a way of improving human relations with machines or worse, an outlet that further limits human to human relationships. And this also extends to chatbots, um, at least potentially. So um, it, and, and it could be that some people in the future will prefer to talking to, um, to talk to a chatbot than to talk to uh, their friends and family about their problems. I think that would be really sad. Um, then the fourth point, AI also raises challenges for teaching medical students. So this is um, uh, re regarding uh, the, the topic um, of um, AI ethics in psychiatry. Um, so in a recent paper, McCoy et al. asked, what do medical students actually need to know about artificial intelligence? And this is challenging because um, while well, competencies for the clinical usage of AI are broadly similar to those for any other novel technology in medicine, there are qualitative differences of critical importance to concerns regarding explainability, health equity, and data security. Okay, and with this, I'd like to um, conclude. So um, I am talked about some theoretical and pro practical problems in psychiatry, and um, we saw that in um, digital and computational psychiatry, they are both actual applications of AI that are now being used, such as mental health apps, and then they are also potential applications by digital phenotyping and um, uh, research on computational psychiatry. And this makes the ethical debate really complex. And uh, just um, keep in mind, uh, ethics is not a tick box exercise. Principles need to be complemented, but more virtues. And um, AI and psychiatry could have really, uh, I think, severe transformative effects on 
definition and classification of mental illnesses and also on human relationships. And these transformative effects will, if they occur, occur really slowly. And therefore, I think this should be really carefully monitored. Thank you for your attention. Okay, now there's some silence and there's always this delay. Hey, Do you want me to chair? Hey, yeah. So there's one question in the chat. Um, oh. I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, you said that it would be sad if people would prefer talking to chatbots than to real humans. Would this really be sad if the people would enjoy this conversation more and if this would hold for long term? Uh, that's a great question. I think it yeah, it, it would it depend on the context, I guess. And um, I mean, if, if people don't have the opportunity to talk to other persons about their problems, or if they just um, find it difficult to talk about certain things, then it can be really an advantage if you have the opportunity to talk to a chatbot. Or um, I, I think it would also be um, great if, um, or, People can have a relationship with a chatbot, a, a kind of a, a, um, um, as, a, as a friendship with a, with a chatbot. I think that's uh, totally fine as long as it does not reduce the amount of communication or, or um, interaction that there is between actual human beings. So maybe I'm a bit too conservative. So this is just the idea, not that um, in, in general it would be sad, but if it's a it, if it becomes a substitute for interactions with other human beings i think then it, it would tend to be sad but I'm, I'm open to discussing this so maybe people have different opinions on this and i'm, I'm not sure um so so maybe what you meant would was just that it can be um can make make your life richer if you also have communications with chatbots. I think that's, um, I, I would agree with that. Um, or if you have interactions with um, chatbots or other um, agents, conversational agents that you just wouldn't be able to have with other human beings, I think that would also be uh, great. I hope Thank that you, that was the, the question. question by Felix Hülsmann. And otherwise you, there's a lot of thank you. Um, would you mind if I, I pose a question by myself? Uh, of sure. myself. So um, you, you mentioned digital phenotypes and that seems to be an interesting thing. One of the things that um, is a problem very often in psychiatry is that uh, the taxonomies are so big, right? And now we have new symptoms likely. Do you think that these digital phenotypes might even like cross cut the taxonomies we have such that we, we get new sub diseases, one that has digital symptoms, the others that don't, just asking generally. Um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I mean, that's one, one of the long-term questions, which, which is also really more philosophical in nature. How will successful applications of digital and computational psychiatry impact on the way we conceive of mental illnesses. How will it change nosology and uh, diagnostic categories? And in, in the near future, I don't think that digital phenotyping will lead to drastic changes, but will just be a complement to existing um, approaches in mental health care and support therapy and so on. So the, I think this will be the, the um, more immediate impact. And then in the long run, it's, it's I, I really don't know. I mean, it's largely an empirical question. How well does this technology work? Does it really allow you to make more fine-grained um, predictions or diagnoses? Or does it just um, make 
certain general will slightly more reliable predictions that don't really allow you to make more fine-grained diagnoses. I, I'm not sure. So um, perhaps, um, I mean, it's, it's an empirical question. And I would bet more on um, theory-driven approaches in computational psychiatry, that at least in certain contexts, maybe when it comes to uh, schizophrenia or major depression, um, depressive, depressive disorder, um, that this will in the long, may in the long run lead to more fine-grained diagnostic categories that are actually based on a mechanistic understanding of the um, of the symptoms. Um, and, and there's the a there's causes. a nice follow-up question in the chat to this, maybe. So Jort Hesself uh, asks, um, what makes the iatry Greek for doctor part computational psychiatry? To me, it sounds like psychopathology is approached in from a very psychology type angle, which in my mind is more in terms of functional characteristics, further removed from physiology. Sorry if this question is very vague, ha ha. So um, maybe you no, can- That's a great question. Yeah, Thank you. I think so too. Yeah, and um, I, I think it depends on the, the particular area in computational psychiatry. Um, so, one potential application of computational psychiatry would um, be to enable psychiatrists to predict um, how a given patient, an individual patient, will respond to medication, um, whether wh which medication would be more effective or have less severe side effects. And um, I think this, this is... Um, clearly what, what um, something that doctors or, or physicians are concerned with. So um, this would be um, a, um, yeah, we would, would speak to the iatry part of, of, of psychiatry. And then maybe um, th th there's also work on or research on, um, on um, uh, further developing um, say, um, psychotherapy um, and such as um, cognitive behavioral therapy based on um, theories about how the, the brain works. And in, in principle, this could yield just to, uh, uh, this, this could result in more effective um, psych, um, therapeutic approaches that could then also be uh, um, taken advantage of by um, psychotherapists that are not themselves um, doctors, maybe. So, um, yeah, I, I think it depends on, on the particular field within computational psychiatry, how much iatry there actually is in there. So, thank you. There are two more questions, if I may. So, um, one is from Bettina Blessing. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. My question, how much knowledge about psychiatry, neurology, clinical practice, psychology, and so on, do the AI developers need to have? I think that's a good question. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. And I think it's impossible to give a general answer because, um, I mean, even if, if you're thinking about, um, just thinking about mental health apps, and then um, research done in theory-driven computation psychiatry. These are actually really different um, fields, and, and they, which would yield or which um, yield different types of um, applications. And so, um, in in general, I, I think what we we can say is that um, there has to be a lot of interaction between people from different fields. And um, so there's, there's a, it's also a question about um, regulating developments of, of mental health apps. Um, and um, yeah, so, I mean, if you, if you just um, have AI developers, in, in the sense of developers of mental health apps in mind, then it um, 
I, I think it also depends on what, what the app is meant to um, provide. So for instance, if it's just meant to provide so, um, access to a peer group, perhaps you, you need to uh, know less about psychiatry, but um, if it's meant to provide information about mental illnesses and so on, then it's, I, I mean, what one, uh, perhaps um, obvious constraint is that this information has to be accurate. It shouldn't give um, users false information about mental illnesses. So um, I think it's really um, critical that, that they, they have some knowledge or um, uh, collaborate with, um, with psychiatrists or, and, and people who know about this. And it, it is really important to ask this question and ask it in different contexts. And, come and, and there will be different answers in different contexts. Thank you. So there's one, one more from uh, Marike van der Vogt. Uh, is there a risk that computational psychiatry misses crucial dimensions of the disorders? For example, complex socio-cultural factors. And could these thereby create a false sense of security? And nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, also, I think one, one of the harder questions, um, it, it would, as always, will depend on the, on the context or on the, on the type of disorder for which um, these applications are developed or for which um, um, research has been um, conducted. And um, the, I think it's a real risk. Um, and I mean, you, you could say, well, we, we are not trying to ignore um, crucial dimensions. We're not trying to ignore social cultural factors. Uh, we're just trying to complement existing approaches, existing therapies, and, um, and, and uh, we, we're building on existing diagnostic categories. We, we don't want to ignore anything. Um, so if, for instance, um, some parts of research on computational psychiatry just focus on brain function, a, I think good justification could be, well, um, we don't claim that we capture everything there is to know about a certain mental illness. We just think that the brain plays an important role in the, in the expression of the disease. And that's why we want to know more about it and uh, see how this can help in making more reliable predictions or um, develop uh, even new therapies and so on. Um, so it does not necessarily ignore important factors, but there, there's a real risk because once there are successful applications, there might be a tendency to say, look, we did this without taking social cultural factors into account. So we don't need that. Um, and this risk might be even higher in, um, in, in digital re research on digital phenotyping because they are really the idea is that we, we need to base um, therapeutic approaches and um, um, monitoring of um, disease progression and how well a treatment works. We have to base that on objective facts, things that can be measured. And there may be a tendency to focus on things that can easily be measured and which would then yeah, ignore more com complex factors, social cultural factors. So, um, and if there's a measurable, measurable positive effect of these approaches or of, of digital phenotyping, if they can say, well, it works, it improves existing approaches, then this could reinforce the conception that mental disorders are disorders of the brain and so on. Um, so in, in, a, yeah. Sorry, she had a comment back. Um, maybe you want to uh, like reply to this as well. Um, even now you already see that most of computational psychiatry of depression is about reward learning as if that is all there is to depression. So that seems to take up a point that you mentioned maybe. Yeah, so I, I agree that there is a risk and there may be a strong tendency. Um, 
which I, I think you could still justify this by saying, look, we are just trying to find out what the contribution of certain um, certain um, uh, deviant ways of information processing in the brain are. We're not saying that this is all to what there is to a depression. We just think that this is a crucial component. Um, but maybe you, you would say, well, even this is a, a too strong assumption. But in, I, I think in general, I, I agree. And um, yeah, there, in, in, at least in, in certain areas, I think there is a real tendency to um, to have a, a kind of restricted conception of mental disorders in mind. In, but if, if you, at least if you um, look at, at um, recent publications, um, many authors are really careful to say that, um, well, we, we, we don't really, we, we don't want to say that mental illnesses are just brain disorders. So it would also be interesting to see if this is just an official statement or if, if it's actually borne out by what, what um, people are doing in their research. So well, in, in the name of everybody, let me thank you, Vandia. Thank you for the nice talk. Very interesting, very timely. Thank you. Um, and thank uh, you, everyone, for your questions. Wonderful. Um, I've heard that we are going to meet at six again for another talk. Um, and until then, there's a short break. How is that going to be? Thank you, Vanya. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. See you later. <laughs>